alone, in a dark room. You look for a light, you see it, and attempt to get closer, but your vision begins to blur. Something's not right. You suddenly feel tired and weak. You're hurt. The closer you get, the further away it seems. Everything you've desired is steps away, but you can barely see it now. So you consider on turning back. Maybe you were never good enough, but who could blame you? The odds have always been against you. The people you trusted turned their backs on you. Maybe you were never meant to win. But did you really come this far just to give up? In life, you will eventually reach a crossroads with a choice to make. Will you take the path less traveled to achieve your dreams, or will you follow everyone else in building theirs? This story talks about someone who had every right to give up, to take a break, to justify failure. In a crushing wave of a serious illness, a friend turned enemy, and no time left, but instead would go on to be a champion in some of the biggest tournaments ever hosted in Rust that Twitch has ever seen, building a career entertaining thousands in the process. I would like you to meet Coconut B. In meeting unsurpassable odds, he has achieved the success so many of us strive for. But how? In order to answer this question, we need to go back to where it all started. Coconut B was born in 1998 and better known to friends and family as Josiah Lim. Living in a poor Canadian household, Coco had to overcome many obstacles growing up as a kid. But in the eyes of young Coco, everything seemed like it was normal. Coco helped his mother clean clothes, not through a laundry machine or a dryer, but a bathtub. With his mother making it a fun game, trying her best to shield Coco from the harsh circumstances of life. In the search of recreation that many of us take for granted today, young Coco would collect empty recyclables, such as cans, plastic bags, and bottles from kids at his school, which he would later sell to a recycling company for a small sum of money. These funds would help his mother, and grant him the opportunity to enjoy a movie from time to time. One year, his family decided to rent out a room to a Korean national student to raise more money for the household. This is where Coco would get his first exposure to gaming, and watching a student play MapleStory, a franchise from the early 2000s. Unknowingly, this experience would have a profound impact on Coco's life, and would motivate him to save up for his own gaming endeavors. At the age of 15, Coco would go on to discover Rust, an upcoming survival game, through watching Frankie on PC in 1080p. He would use this game to escape from the real world of cruel realities, building a little shop in Next Valley on Legacy Rust. He would not find much success in his venture, as he'd be greeted with a slug to the head by an individual with the username of twitch.tv slash drowsy. Coco wondered who this person was and why they had killed him unprovoked. And searching his name online, he came to realize that Trousy was one of the first Rust streamers, streaming his gameplay to around 40 viewers on a small website known as Twitch. This was the first time Coco would learn what streaming was. With Twitch only being a few years old, he was intrigued by the fact that people could stream their gameplay to others on this site. Seeing the success Trousy had achieved from streaming, with the skill he possessed and a game he enjoyed, he was now motivated by the fury of his own encounter to do the same. Coco has always said he's not a very talented individual when starting his career, but one thing he had going for him was consistency. The significance of putting in 100% compared to those who might be naturally talented or knowledgeable is what makes the difference. Coco showed he could do exactly that, working three times as hard to build a following on Twitch to get better at Rust. Being so committed to his stream, Coco would show a lot of similarities to the character Ferris Bueller from the iconic movie Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Getting dropped off from school by his mother would sneak out to return home from a two-hour walk and attempts to start the stream early. Even going as far, pretending to be his Korean father, putting on an accent to excuse himself for the missed absences. All for the purpose of achieving the title of a partnered streamer for Twitch. Having a passion means like you're gonna have this gem in life. They're gonna try to take this gem away from you. And it's in your power and your responsibility to protect this gem with everything you fucking got. Coco held that commitment and didn't give up. Twitch growing in popularity saw Coco go from a few viewers to around 100. He was holding his promise. Streaming had become mainstream, 
taking Twitch from having a concurring 6 billion minutes watched a month to a staggering 660 billion minutes watched, proving to many skeptics it was actually possible to have a career on Twitch. On the other hand, his motivation was dwindling. He had already made it, right? He had achieved his purpose in building a following. Maybe it was time to take things easy. No. Even though Coco was earning an income, it was nothing to the extent he could do this full time forever. So he made the choice to leave his home and family and moving to California with no support net would either have to make it as a streamer or go home in defeat failing to do so. And living off bread and barely getting by in California, Coco was struggling. To make matters worse, he would receive a call that would change his life forever. And coming from a background of Korean culture, his family always focused on the importance of school, getting the best grades to work a job that paid the best money. Coco was considered an outlier for his interest. While his cousins were talented with an instrument or were achieving great grades in school, his interests were frowned upon. Coco had practically failed out of school, making his family disappointed, and more specifically, his father, who Coco began to despise after many years due to neglect and the way he treated his family with issues of alcohol. But this was all coming to an end in a terrible way, as his father was dying of cancer and had a few days left to live, while he was streaming on a rough day with around 9 to 12 viewers. In 2018, Coco would receive a call from his father where they would speak for the last time. His final words would be, Son, I don't want you to be a loser like me. Please give up on streaming. The call ended, and that would be the last time Coco ever spoke to his dad. He stared at his computer, with the stream still running, and wondered, is my father right? In the brief moment of fear and anxiety, Coco had a choice to make. To listen to his father and pursue something else? Or to prove him wrong? Coco said fuck and went back to his stream. He was now fueled with a fire that he had never experienced before in his life. He wanted to prove his father wrong, to show that he would be successful and would make his family proud, no matter the stakes. In the background of all this, Rust was searching to reach bigger markets, having ranged from 50,000 to 60,000 players for several years. Face Punch wanted to take the game to the next level. With a pandemic taking the world by storm in 2020, and everyone locked away at home, they would get an opportunity to do exactly that. Rust had always failed in the community's efforts of esports, with Keemstar in 2016 leaving bad impressions of the game's competitive potential with Rust Conquest. Did you find him, I quit, dude. I'm never fucking playing this game on stream ever again. Opening up the floor to more neglected community events, such as the big game, Rust Takeover, and Rust Rivals. On the other hand, Rust had always been very successful with charity events, donating hundreds of thousands of dollars through charitable Rust. And noticing this trend, Face Punch would go on to support the owners of Rustoria, who started their first charity tournament, known as Trust in Rust. For how competitive Coco is, he always hoped Rust would go into a more competitive direction. Even being a critic to the game's previous failed events would come back to support any new attempts. And the dream that someone could make it work. Rustoria did exactly that. Using the format from their game mode known as Base Invaders, players would farm, build, PvP, and raid against each other in a timed event through three phases, where groups attempted to be the last to survive in protecting their TC. The tournament happened, and everyone's surprised it was a massive success, raising over $13,000. Coco took notice, and so did Twitch, that Rust might have a chance on the main stage with an even bigger tournament the world had never seen before. Which rivals Rust game battle would be that tournament? Rustori had proved they could do it, and with the endorsements of H June, Twitch took action to make it happen. Hosting the first one in April of 2022, where two teams of 40 Spanish and 40 English speaking streamers and creators would compete for dog tags, and the team with the most collected would win. With Alex by 11 running the Spanish team and Disguise Toast leading the English one, the players were sure to be competitive with the biggest prize pool Rust has ever seen. Coco had been in search of an event like this for almost 8 years. He now had the opportunity to prove himself as a winner on a stage that extended far further than he could have ever imagined. With the most renowned streamers from every faucet of Twitch competing, Coco had the chance to make it big. The tournament stood strong in regards to organization, 
and technical management. However, you'll quickly realize that drama will always be a hidden outlier among these events. With an early game advantage, the Spanish team started off strong, and initially everything seemed fair and fun. However, as things progressed, aggression began to escalate beyond the tournament, where Spanish streamers started making racial remarks and harassing other creators. Coconut B would take the blunt of most of this backlash, being one of the top players ranking second for the most total points earned. It is likely that a dispute with an extremely popular Spanish creator known as Aaron Plays with a whopping 30 million subscribers committed to some of the specific targeting of Coco over the use of a stolen thumbnail from his previous videos. I predict that this tournament is going to end and they're going to leave. I feel like we're going to be ahead on points and they'll leave, not even see this entire thing through. I, I really do. I think they're gonna log off, dude. As tensions rose, and with a major margin building of 20,000 points for the English-speaking team, the Spanish creators quit, disavowing the event, and claiming they would never return. No one could really expect the creators were gonna behave in such an unprofessional manner, and a couple of instances of drama shouldn't ruin it for everyone, so time to try it again with Twitch Rivals Game Battle 2. Things would begin to get more serious, now with 40 players and 4 teams to win $100,000. In a 100 hour event, players would individually win more if they won. You would have XQC and Disguised Toast running the North American teams, while Team Delacard and Team Greg F would bring in creators from Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. With most of the Spanish drama out of the way, and the organizers already having a bit of experience with how things worked, the event should be better. And it was! Viewers got the entertainment value they deserved, streamers had fun and they were able to compete without many complaints. In the 5 day tournament you would have Team Greg F eliminated in day 3, Team Delacard in day 4, leaving us to the final day of the event with Team XQC vs Disguised Toast. Initially starting in a tie, Team Disguised Toast would go on to beat out XQC with over 250 points. Disguised Toast team cheered, with fireworks bursting in the air, and everyone congratulating each other was a mere calm before the storm for what was about to happen next. Rust players are probably some of the most competitive people you will find online. Being so eager to win every wiper event, it makes sense that some friction would occur, especially against other Rust players. In Game Battle 1, you had 50% of the participants being variety streamers, who played multiple different games, did just chatting, or played a main game like Minecraft or World of Warcraft. 25% of the participants coming from a semi-competitive background, being a professional in Apex Legends, CSGO, or Call of Duty, while the other 25% of players were hardcore Rust players and creators. Things would feel pretty balanced in an event like this, with only a quarter of the creators being from Rust, making things less competitive. Game Battle 2 would go on to change that for the first time, as the two finalist teams with XQC and Disguised Toast having 40% of their team being Rust creators or competitive players. Concern grew underneath the laughter and friendly comments among the rival teams. Deep down, a few players wondered if everything was actually fair for this ending. Many could only speculate. At the end of the day, the tournament was over, and the outcome was settled. It would take Twitch Rivals Rust Game Battle 3 to truly answer the question. This event could be considered the most anticipated event in the game's history. Twitch Rivals had increased the stakes once again exciting many of the veteran Rust creators for what was to come. In the first game battle, we saw two teams. In the second, we saw four. Now you would have an astonishing eight teams with 20 creators each, totaling to 160 participants, and the highest payout seen for all winning players. What would make this event an even greater challenge for the teams is you would now have four original Rust creators leading their own. Well and known for his Rust stories and narratives, Panpot's taking charge for the notorious Spanish team previously run by Alex by 11. Finally, H. June and Coconut B, considered to be some of the most competitive Rust players, would now be going head to head to take the title, not as a member of the winning team, but the leader of one. Let's not forget the creators beyond Rust with Delicard, a previous contender and popular variety streamer, Power, notable for his success in Fortnite, JL Tomy, and Buddha, who are widely recognized for their roleplay in GTA 5 would also be making an appearance with the same goal of winning. All this competition would begin to fuel a drama never seen in a professional setting for Rust. And it's time we take a deep dive into what actually happened behind the scenes and you can decide who is right or wrong and what you think is fair. 
Twitch rivals Face Punch and Rustoria wanted to host a fair event that truly represented what Rust was all about. Their interests have always been focused towards the best entertainment value for the player and the viewer. Cloudfuel would go to be the main organizer of this event to make sure it was possible to give the best experience for everyone involved. Even while Twitch pushed massive layoffs due to economic and business trends. Hjune, being the original pioneer of Trust in Rust alongside Rustoria, had been a massive asset in getting these events where they are today. Building the streamer community and speaking out for what creators really wanted made this possible. But deep down, Hjune was a competitive player at heart and always strived to win. Becoming a team captain would now show if he had it to make it on his own. Coconut B was also in a similar mindset. Having been a player on the first two events would be happy to lead his first team as a captain. Thanks to endorsements from other previous participants, one of those being Hjun. As the meetings took place and the team rosters began to release, Coconut B would express his concern for Hjun's roster, feeling it might not hold up fair to himself and other captains. Hjun would rebuttal against those claims, and this is where a multi-day drama unfolded where team captains battled it out to decide what was fair for this event. It can be assumed that Hjun was not prepared to fight on this front, heavily involved in the events from the beginning, probably felt a form of betrayal from Coco, as Hjun had put in a good word for him to become a captain. Other players, and notably Trousy, would feel the same way in this competitive feud. It's unlikely there was any hate between these individuals, they were all just very competitive Rust players, and they all wanted to win. The competitive ideals from Coconut B and Hjun clashed with what Face Punch, Twitch Rivals, and Rustoria had originally in mind. As for companies, they focused on the perspective of community, and less on the balancing or competitive aspects of teams. If they knew it would be more about sport rather than content, it's likely that they would have been more hands-on in making the teams themselves, as there is no impact when a streamer picks someone for content, but there is a competitive advantage for being selected based off skill. But the drama had set its course, and now everyone had to watch it unfold, uncertain of what would happen. At the time of releasing this video, Htune has not responded for an interview. I'm happy to do a follow-up video if he decides to reach out in the future. So what was the actual argument being made? Well, Htune had some of the best players from previous events on his team, with Coco and many others considering most of them to be on a skill level of 10, with 10 being the highest. It seemed the organizers and team captains wanted Hjun to remove one of these five players in favor of a lesser skilled player to balance out the playing field. In the recourse of changing teams, Hjun made compromises removing competitive players such as Etone, known for being a top player in the Rust clan scene, or Optic Karma, who is a competitive Call of Duty pro, but in doing so would begin to add replacements others considered equally competitive, such as Eltic, Stimpy's girlfriend and Sippy Tango, a very old school Rust streamer. This was not the desired outcome everyone had wanted. This drama would be further pushed into the public spotlight with the unintentional leaks from Aiden, a player who was streaming on Coconut Bee's team. This would also be rumored from other captains, eventually making its way to the public eye in a short time frame, applying outside pressure and drama for what community members felt their favorite creators should do and what was fair. Hjun had not removed any of the top 5 members, and from his perspective, it's reasonable to see that even removing one of these players would weaken his competitive edge. So in the midst of frustration and the heavy pushback he was receiving, he made another change, removing Blueprint, who is his 6th top player and had a rating of 8.5 on the decided scale from the team captains along with uninviting Sippy Tango and Eltic to play on his team. It was unlikely that Hjun had intentions to make Blueprint upset in any way, but would argue that he was forced to kick Blueprint due to pressure from other team captains and organizers. Blueprint was rightfully deeply upset. Having participated in the previous Twitch rivals, he felt this was a targeted situation towards him. He would go on to express his concern on a twit longer on how he felt it was unfair to be removed when he was one of the original people invited to the event. Blueprint's tweet shined a spotlight on the controversy to a bigger scale, with many other large creators agreeing that Blueprint was in the right for the way he was feeling, and put negative pressure on the organizers for the concerns of what was happening behind closed doors. I was immediately blocked by Trousy and Ruder and uh, Hshun, and I mean, Hshun blocked me before the event started, and uh, on his stream he pretty much said, I never want to be friends with Coco again. Like, we were all really good friends. Like, I, I, 
and like dude like i trousy is a streamer i grew up watching like he's the reason i became a streamer he's the reason why i wanted to play this game that guy was my idol man h june seeing the escalation of the situation and the wave of backlash coming from organizers would try to step in to gain control with his 24 page twit longer in explaining what was actually taking place from his perspective discussing how the core issue revolved around his top five players and said that no one was at fault and to please respect the organizers. H. June would quote, the tweet itself was not the full context of our situation and it was easy to think that it was face punch and rivals fault. I asked, so I have to kick Blue, Eltic and Sippy? I was told yes and they would have to be firm unfortunately with the deadline being so close. With the glaring publicity given to the situation from this post, it would go to upset Cloudfuel, who was working tirelessly around the clock. He did not appreciate a private situation with team captains being broadcasted to such a wide scale. Cloudfuel would express his concerns in saying, Yes, you were told that your teams need to be adjusted. Yes, you were told your top five is way too strong. No. You were not told that you specifically need to remove Blue, Eltic, and Sippy Tango. You were told that you could not add them if you kept your current roster as it was. You were specifically told that you could drop someone like Hutnik for Blue. You said that you had no interest in doing that. The issue is that you have Michael Jordan, LeBron James, Kobe Bryant, Larry Bird, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar already on your team. You can't then try to add Wilt Chamberlain and think that will be okay. If you want to drop one of these greats for another great, then you absolutely can, but you cannot have six greats. The situation eventually settled out, unfortunately with Blueprint out of the picture. In the end, he had his team of his original top five players. Face Punch, Twitch Rivals, and Rustoria, alongside Cloudfuel, were now willing to proceed after changes made to everyone's teams, and removing skilled players such as Frost for Coconut Bee's team and Blueprint for H. June's team. Twitch rivals' captains felt that the event was better balanced, and there was no time left to further critique teams. The show must go on, and now we are ready to take the journey to see who would win. And we begin. On day one, all eight teams would become acquainted with their island, as they would be spending the next five days here in-game, and for a majority, their real lives being accompanied by a 15x15 15 15 building plot and a build area for a hemp farm. The objective remained the same. The group with the most dog tags collected would win. These could be received through events, killing other players, or raiding bases, which were only allowed on the last four to five hours of the event. The first four hours would be tier zero, giving players access to an Ioka and a bow while they learn the ropes of the world they were about to enter. Help me, boy! See, black, see, 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 come on, I'm gonna go. Getting uh, reports, summits. <laughs> He's helpful. asleep, apparently. That's he not true. So I'm like... here. That's not true. <laughs> See, it's all false information. <laughs> Coconut Bee's team would be the first to score, but would be swiftly overtaken by many other teams as they tried to gain a lead. Tier 1 would come into play after 4 hours and would last for 12, where players could now craft crossbows, better armor, and revolvers. H. June's team took the lead with a 100 point margin. Coconut B's team would take the lead back at the beginning of this next phase. By the way, this is why you don't get laid. I'm not kidding. This is why you do not get laid. This is why you have no bitches. This is why you look like a fucking troglodyte. Tier 2 would begin after the first 12 hours, with most players being able to craft weapons like MP5, semi auto rifles, now being assisted with additional protection from hazmat suits and road sign. Day 2. Many players would wake up to H. June in the lead, beginning to build a margin that would be very difficult for many to beat. But maybe they would have a chance with the introduction of Tier 3 items such as AKs and rockets. Right, you have quite oh. a large splash there. Oh, oh wow! Who is that? Porgy! It's Porgy! Porgy! H. June's team would close out the day with a lead of around 150 points and closing in on a total score of 1,100 points. Day 3. H. June would obtain 1,500 points in Day 3, where the lead had grown exponentially from Day 2. Fear began to linger across all team captains that the odds were low that they could even win. But with two days remaining, there might be a chance they could catch up. 
I'm dead. You just killed all of us. Oh. You just oh, killed him. Bro, what? this dumb just moved it's right in front bad. of me at the last second when I'm right when I'm about to shoot. Day four. Coco's team would fight back, obtaining a total of 2,000 points in the start of day four, where Hjun's team would be multiple steps ahead, gaining a total of 2,600 points. Exhaustion was hitting everyone, and a lot of players on the losing teams began to take things in a more recreational tone. Just got shot inside the <laughs> I'm running over to uh... What are they even singing? What song is that? <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> After some much needed sleep, many players with the few hours they got pushed forward to begin raiding hemp bases, other teams forward operating bases, which was now allowed. With Coco's team striking down Buddha's forward operating base and hemp bases for Team H June, Team Buddha, and Team Wellen, before being countered by the Spanish team where many decide to take a well-needed nap before entering the final day of the event. But someone was not feeling well beyond the low levels of sleep or stress from the event. On May 5th, Coconut B would go to post a video on Twitter showing his POV for Wipe Day. This would seem normal until looking closer to find an IV bag connected to his arm. There was a bit of concern, but many would assume this might not be too serious of an illness. Twitch Rivals was two weeks away, about to start on the 16th of May, and you'd want to be in your best physical health to have the most optimal performance while playing. Unfortunately, the truth would reveal that Koku's health was not getting better, only worse. With three days into the event, on May 18th, Koku would go on to say this on Twitter, Going to the hospital, been throwing up for the past five days, 102 fever, intense migraine, insane fatigue, something is definitely wrong. This shocked many fans and creators that he'd been holding through during this whole event with the sickness he had. The worry came to the top of Coco's mind, that he might not see the end of the event. It would turn out to be that this illness was a form of chronic fatigue. Mononucleosis, or mono, the most serious symptoms appearing with fever, sore throat, head and body aches, swollen liver, spleen, and extreme fatigue lasting two to six weeks. Being in the acute phase in the middle of a highly competitive online tournament was the worst possible luck. When Coco fell ill, it was a sickness like I've never seen. If I had to count, he threw up maybe minimum 30 times a day. Everything, and I mean everything he consumed, he would instantly throw up. He couldn't even look at his monitor uh, without getting nauseous. I tried calling his doctor and asked what we could do. He recommended was Tylenol, room temperature zero Gatorade, and rest. I did a bit of research myself, and I found out that high doses of vitamin C help. So I called about 10 different nurses. They all said they wouldn't be able to get there for another five hours or even the next day. So I called one last place before I gave up and they got a nurse to come to our Airbnb within the next 30 minutes. And he was playing and he didn't want to take a break because Team Mendo raiding his fob at the time. So he had to get on and defend it somehow. And the nurse was surprisingly fine with treating him while he was doing all of that. I ran him a bath um, in the upstairs of the Airbnb and was downstairs making some soup for him. And then I heard the water stop running and then a loud thud. I instantly ran up there and I saw his head sticking out the bathroom doorway, face flat on the floor. He hurt his ribs and knees and uh, his right knee when he hit the floor. But uh, this was the same night we had to take him to the hospital. Coco would begin to take several trips to the hospital, with his final one being on the last day of the event. Lying down in the hospital bed with a fury of a fever and fatigue beyond imaginable, Coco was nowhere near dying by any chance, but felt extreme shame. This event to most creators probably felt like a five-day event. To Coco, this was a 10-year journey to make it to this point. He would type to his team on Discord and his fans through Twitch chat, trying to decide what he should do at a crossroads, again. No one would blame Coco for his illness, and with a gap of almost a thousand points away, odds were very slim that Coco's team would win. Maybe it was time to step back to recover, and live to fight another day. But why would you throw everything away when you've come this far? He would let his team decide, with the clock ticking of 14 hours remaining. Should he return, or could they try to continue without him? In the beginning, I definitely didn't understand how sick Coco was. It wasn't about rivals anymore. It was more of, we hope that our captain feels better. 
I was worried, man. Like, it sounded serious, and I know he, like, he really pushes himself. Day three or four, he sounded really bad. I mean, if I was that ill, I don't think I'd be even thinking about Rust, regardless of like, how much money was on the line. Like, it just changed the entire dynamic. Like, if you watch every fight that goes well, it's because Coco is, like, screaming at us to tell us where to go and what to do, and we're all listening. But I think it honestly inspired us more to see how hard he was trying and how hard he was fighting, regardless of the situation. But I had a feeling, like, I don't know what it was, but I just kind of knew, like, he was going to hang about. Despite us telling him to take care of himself first, we all knew that he'd ignore our advice and stick through the event. So a decision was made. Coco would return to give his team a second chance. Driving home in a rush, emotions were heightened beyond belief for what would come. But had Coco made the right call? Well, day five would answer if this was all for nothing. Coming home to see Team H June's staggering lead of 1,400 points over Coconut B's team was demoralizing. This was a massive lead over every other team. It would be an impossible feat to collect that many tags with so little time remaining. However, Everyone was given one last chance. With the remaining four to five hours left of the event, all teams would have a chance to redeem their title. In raiding an enemy team, they would be eliminated, and you could collect all their dog tags. So who would raid who? While it's always easy being the defender than the attacker historically, the attackers almost always fail. So this job could not be done alone. It was time for Coco to make a deal. If he wanted to win, he would need to ally with another team to successfully raid a group with a sufficient amount of points. To all the team captains, the most appealing target seemed to be Team H June. Come on, pick up! Stop fucking calling. Oh fuck. Alright, let, let, let's talk business, let's talk business. When can you make this transfer? I'm not gonna lie, Will, and I feel a bit uneasy about our, uh, negotiation and our policies now. What's making you feel uneasy? You just had a call with Team H, and now all of a sudden you want to have a speedy transfer. I'm a little uneasy right now, so I'd appreciate it if you could, uh, relieve the tension. I'd love to relieve the tension. Lie down. What? Are you lying down? <laughs> what the hell? Okay, sorry. No, no, no. I think you call drop for a second. Sorry, I was, I was talking to somebody else. I swear on Emmanuel Macron, me, I believe you, I trust you 100%, but my team don't trust you. They think you're gonna uh, kill, kill me, so we're gonna come, but not on your island. Gotcha. Let's, take out, let's take out these sons of bitches, Wiljum. Godspeed! With being second in the lead and having a strong suit for competition, it would be fair to say a lot of teams did not trust Coconut B, but these teams needed to work together if they wanted to win. France and JL Tomy, Delacard and Wiljum, and Team Wellen decided to make a deal. Less than four hours left, all four teams with roughly 20 players each would make an assault on Team H June. Eliminating H June's team from the event would create a chance for everyone else to win. Arriving first to H June's island, Coco's team would immediately lose their builder, lowering the chances of success that they could pull this off. Um, yeah, when I died with all the raid base mats on me, that was, it was definitely a low sinking feeling. I was just rushing ahead, like it probably wasn't the move. Immediately respawned and just saw and listened to the comms and stuff like that as people are going down and down and I'm like... As H June's team surrounded their forward operating base, it looked like it could be over before it even started. Team Wellen and Team France would arrive shortly after in attempts to assist, and Coco's team would be able to make their fob for this raid. But it was already over, the momentum was gone, and they were swiftly obliterated by Team H June. Everyone had failed. On the other side of the map, we would see a similar fate for Team Wiljum, who had betrayed Coconut B to raid Buddha, while Buddha's team tried to raid Team Spain and failed. This looked to be the end. No teams were eliminated. Everyone had failed except Team H June, holding their staggering lead of points from PvP and events. Now all they had to do was wait out the clock to win. Morale was in the negative. Countless hours of gameplay, stress, and pressure made everyone very sad. Specifically for Coco's team, they were so close, yet so far being in second place. It felt fair that maybe now was a time for a well-deserved break. Everyone truly tried their best, but why not see it through? It felt impossible that there could be any different outcome, but who knows? Anything could happen in Rust. 
and what would happen next would be hard to comprehend. Buddha would be attacked again by Team Spain only to successfully defend. Team h would try to widen their margin of a win by raiding Team France only to be defeated. Then, out of nowhere, a sporadic text of eliminations would appear. Team Spain eliminated Team Buddha. There is now 3,337 points that could be claimed, and for those who could successfully return them, would likely win. What would happen next could be described as pure luck, a coincidence, a fluke. But what really is luck? When opportunity meets preparedness, and those who were patient and didn't give in when times got tough, would now have the chance to fight the odds, to make their dreams come true. The middle, right? You're going from the middle? Yes, yes. If we don't rock it, we won't get there, yo. Vamos, vamos. Aquí está el armario, bro, puertas HQ. TC, 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 TC. Muévete, 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 muévete. Tiro pepo, tiro pepo. Eliminado, eliminado. La chapa, la chapa, la chapa. We gotta get in there, we gotta get in there. Got an A-camp, oh, no, no. TC, TC, yeah. Let's do this shit! They might have it, they might have it. No, me morí, me morí, me morí, me morí. Yo lo tengo. All the switch, guys. Me matan, me matan, me matan. Me matan. En el humo, en el humo, en el humo, me matan. Everyone's gotta make a play. Estoy en el humo. Oh. If we, they just leave with the dog tags, they, the they, they win. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh. yeah it's already oh, got it. Got it. They're getting fucking pounded. They're getting pounded, bro. Look, look, it's red on the map moving. What is that? Is that that's what? it, yeah? That's, that's it. it. That's, that's, that's the tags. That's the tags. Nah, they got it. Yeah, they are both the fucking I don't know. I have, have I, have I, have I have a mini. I have a mini. Do they have a scrappy? I have a mini. Oh, guys, I'm in here. Oh, shit! 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 Oh, ¿Qué, ¿Qué se ve? ¿Qué se ve? Abrir el mapa, nadie, nadie. Me va a matar. Pero pide las chapas, pero pide las chapas que caen abajo, no sé. Me va a matar, me mata, me mata. Ah, no. Me mata. Me va a matar, me va a morir. I said it! I fucking said! Get this shit out! Boys, boys, we need to counter this raid, it's ancient raid, we need to counter this raid, it's ancient raid. Where's the tags? I don't have them. I don't have them! I don't have yes. them! Yo, yo, yo! Guys, I don't have the tent! Yo, I guys, see them! I think I see it! I got it! I got it! Pick me up! I'm fucking! Pick me up! Pick me up! Let's go! Go on, go on! Go! 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 Let's go! 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 Fly! Go! Go! Fly! Go! 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 We're gonna get killed. Morg, Morg. We didn't fucking give up. We fought a goddamn hard sell team. Team, listen to me. We won. Team, get it in. Great team. Great.
team! You've watched me, you, you've watched me, you watched a man get his dream today. You truly did, you truly fucking did. <sighs> Holy shit. Woo! I could die right now and I'd be, I would, I would care. Less than 20 minutes left of the whole tournament. Did not even think in a million years that this could happen. Didn't think I was anywhere near close to featuring in a Twitch rival, so I'm just super thankful to everyone that gave the okay to that, and it was great. With the tournament of this size, I feel like we actually did something to like have that immortalized in the history of the game. After dumping hours upon hours in a rust, that felt really good. To win on a team against some of the best content creators, some of the best Rust players, it was a crowning achievement. Like, I cried. Everything lined up. It was so perfect. It did not feel that it was real. I was in a dream. They all brought their own. They all carried their own. They were there. They showed up. I just appreciate being a part of it. And in the future, I feel like this is something that I'll look back on and reminisce about. Heaven. No. I can't think of a better word than that. What's like a good word for like a really fantastic ending? It was just peace. Team Coconut B had done it. They won. Years of commitment, a serious illness, community backlash, constant pressure, and impossible odds. Yet somehow, he managed to achieve his dreams. He proved his father wrong, making a career in entertainment from nothing to winning the biggest tournament from his childhood game through 10 years of hard work. This was a moment of a lifetime. Some cried. Some pondered. No matter no matter who wins, I feel like it's tarnished. So like, I don't know Wait, why so everyone is Coco really just found putting me against Coco someone for some running? reason. Others laughed and cheered. We did it, bro! We fucking, we fucking did it, dude! It's a surreal feeling. So many emotions that I could not even find words to describe how Coconut Bee truly felt in this moment. And we will never know fully how he was feeling. Other than the fact that he made all this happen, he had won. What did we learn on this journey? That anything is possible and success is never easy. Coconut B achieved his dreams and will strive to obtain many more. He serves as a modern example of what it takes to be successful. So whatever it is you seek, your desires, goals, and dreams, you can make them happen. Never give up. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe if you would like to hear more stories like this in the future, and I hope you enjoyed your stay.